I'm sitting in my kitchen on a hot July morning. Windows are wide open to catch even the faintest breeze which might help mitigate the swelter. But I'll be shutting them soon to keep the house in the dim light, self-convincing me that these would keep the house cooler for a couple more hours. The deafening cicadas chorus is piercing your ears and mind from dawn till sunset, when they will slowly give space to crickets and frog symphony. This is the sound of my Tuscan summer, a sound I'd love you to experience, along with a bowl of properly made panzanella salad. That's why I'm asking you to skip Florence on your next trip to Tuscany. Before the new episode of this podcast, I would love to thank you for your precious support, even during these months where we've been silent here. I'm touched by your comments and happy to know that this podcast has brought some peace, inspiration and practical advice, along with a pinch of Italian soul. This podcast is hosted on Substack, the new writing platform where our newsletter, Letters from Tuscany, is also hosted. If you like this episode, want to share a comment about it and join the conversation, you can find the link in this episode's show notes. And now, let's start. Ciao! My name is Giulia Scarpaleggia. I am a Tuscan-born and bred country girl, a home cook, a food writer and a photographer. I teach Tuscan cooking classes in my house in the countryside and I've been sharing honest, reliable Italian recipes for 10 years now through my cookbooks and my blog, juleskitchen.com. If you love everything about Italian food, big crowded tables and seasonal ingredients, join us and follow this podcast, Cooking with an Italian Accent. I know, when you travel, you want to squeeze into your week-long holiday as much as you can. When you're in Tuscany, you have a long list of to-dos you've been dreaming about for years. Our galleries and museums, that outstanding restaurant everyone is raving about, as many gelatos as you can possibly eat, artisanal shops and small producers, Instagram-worthy sunsets over a river, cobble streets and Renaissance cathedrals. Hundreds of thousands of tourists often have the same to-do list, though. I don't want to be judgmental, and if it is your first time in Italy or Tuscany, Florence can be your first and only destination. The problem here is how we handle the flow of tourists that are blessing, and sometimes ruining, Tuscany as a destination, rather than a place to enjoy, slowing down and savoring your time. I just want to share another possible way of traveling that takes into account both the uncontrolled flow of tourism that is saturating most of our icon destinations, I'll be talking about Tuscany, but the same can be said about Cinque Terre, Venice or Rome, and the climate change that is turning most of our cities into furnaces. And this is true for other countries as well. Take, for example, Scotland, where Tommaso and I honeymooned in October five years ago. During our on-road travels, several times, we wonder how we could have enjoyed the breathtaking sceneries during the high season, when the roads are so narrow that not more than one car can pass at a time. Imagine buses full of tourists. I cannot emphasize enough, though, the fact that the responsibility doesn't lie on you, planning your dream holiday to Tuscany, but on the political and economic system that is not able to manage the current flow of tourists that are choosing Italy as their holiday destination. Tuscany often lives on the fat of the land, and Italy as a tourist system too. Who needs a properly done promotion when your pressing problem is where to feed all the tourists that come during the high season? Why would you want to spend money on resources in creating a better storytelling of a destination that lives on its past glorious centuries of history, art, postcard landscapes and the more recent fame of good food? Truly sustainable tourism happens when the government manages to reconcile the quality of life of resident citizens with the quality of life and experience of temporary citizens, the tourists. It sounds quite utopic as a dream, but we can move little steps toward this goal. We too are actors of the tourist system when we share stories about our daily life in Tuscany with thousands of you, 
and when we bring almost 400 students every year to our area for our cooking classes. I know small numbers compared to mass tourism, but it's a beginning, a new narrative, a sparkle of hope. The way we often communicate Italy is indeed part of the problem. A stereotyped tale of apron dress nonnas making fresh pasta, daily aperitivo on a terrace, quaint medieval villages perched on a hilltop, and Vespa rides in a sun drenched countryside. Years ago, I gave a speech for a student abroad program in Siena. Young Americans were quite surprised. But you don't have an aperitivo every night, they told me. You come to Tuscany and you are part of a staging that does not correspond to what you actually find here. I am also asked if we take a siesta after lunch every day, if I make fresh pasta at every meal. The stereotypical idea of Italians always living a slow life is not only untruthful, but also risky, as it puts in the shade, innovation, hard work, social crisis, and so many other factors that make up the varied and sometimes challenging life in Italy. So who's responsible for this cliché narrative that speaks of a glorious past that often didn't even exist? What can we do to make tourism more sustainable for our land and for the local people, and definitely more enjoyable for you? Now I'll be sharing my two cents on this, but I would love to know your thoughts as well. If you want to join the conversation, you can find the Substack link in this episode's show notes. Traveling during the low season, November to March, could be a possible solution. And this is when you would enjoy and experience a different Tuscany, less crowded, more relaxed. That's the real slow life. Obviously, this also depends a lot on your job and on your family management. For many people, holidays are set and they cannot travel during the low season, even if they would love to do that. Moreover, when you travel during the low season, you have to keep in mind that some restaurants might be closed and there might be less availability for activities and experiences. But what could have been a deterrent for traveling during the low season in the past, the bad weather, should be now enough to convince you to move your trip to Italy to another time of the year, skipping the peak of summer in Italy. Extreme heat waves, merciless muggy weather, wildfires, thunderstorms, but also electric blackouts that hit the residents of major cities, not able to provide enough energy at the same time to the inhabitants and to the tourists staying mainly in the city centers. But you can choose. You can be part of the solution. You can choose when to travel where to travel, what to do. Whether you are traveling during the low season or in the peak of summer, you can choose. You can be part of the problem, queuing for hours for an ordinary focaccia that the whole world is raving about. Or you can take the less obvious path, walk a back street, wander in suburban neighborhoods and buy a Lampredotto panino from a stall in a little square where locals are quietly waiting for their lunch or from that unassuming little hole in the wall where they stuff your focaccia with pecorino and prosciutto with the same love and care of 10 years ago. Your choice is political, always. You have other options too. You could slow down and enjoy the provincial life of a small town. There are many regions in Italy that are not as crowded as Tuscany, and many towns in Tuscany where you are surrounded by locals at the weekly market and where you don't have to queue for hours for a panino. Probably they are not as Instagram worthy, but why do we have to keep planning our holidays based just on a photo opportunity? And who decides what is Instagram worthy after all? It's time for a new narrative. Take my town, Colle Valdelsa, an underrated medieval town still unknown to many tourists and even to many of the locals. It has a privileged position, one hour from Florence, half an hour from Siena, San Gimignano and Volterra, with little gems worth discovering. If going out for dinner is part of your idea of a perfect vacation, here in Colle you can find everything you might want in Tuscany, from a restaurant with two Milician stars to a typical Tuscan trattoria, or even the best pizza I've ever had. We recently shared a guide to my town in our newsletter on Substack, I'll leave the link in this episode's show notes. 
But you have to know that initially I was torn about whether to share this guide or not. I like how Colle Valdelsa feels still authentic, sometimes sleepy, probably unprepared for mass tourism, and it's imperfect and rough at times. I love to randomly bump into friends from elementary school or high school and exchange tips on newfound pizzerias or farms selling their vegetables. There is still room to grow, to perfect hospitality, to work on events and fairs that are still missing in this area, to build a network of producers, chefs, artisans, farmers and shop owners to improve the experience, not only for tourists, but first and foremost for us who live here all year long. So why should you consider Colle Valdelsa for your next trip to Tuscany rather than Florence? I'm taking my town as an example, but the same could be said for Castle Delsa, Radicondoli, Chiusdino, Gambassi Terme, but even bigger cities like Pistoia, so close to Florence and Lucca, yet not so packed with tourists, where your stay could be much more sustainable and enjoyable. If you're renting a car, there are agriturismos scattered all over the countryside, where you could stay on a working farm and enjoy slower rhythms, seasonal products, homemade breakfasts and human relationships. I'm thinking about the extraordinary work our friends at Agriturismo Enrico are doing in Val d'Orcia. Always listen to their travel tips, as they are able to guide you to unexpected experiences off the beaten path. Moving outside of our region, how not to think about Cadememi in the Venetian countryside or Casale Centurione near Gran Sasso in Abruzzo. Don't worry, you'll find all these links in this episode show notes. If you're relying on public transportation, bus or train, opt for hotels built in old palazzi in the historical center, quaint B&Bs or spacious apartments where you can cook a couple of your meals with the fresh produce you bought at the local market. Wake up in the morning with an espresso and a cornetto in the bar down the road and fill your days with tastings, day trips, people watching hours in a tree-shaded piazza or resting afternoons by a swimming pool. Pick a local restaurant for dinner and find yourself going back the day after to sample more dishes from their menu. In one of these smaller towns, on a summer day, you could still hear the deafening cicada chorus that fades into a cricket symphony at night. All these thoughts, along with the extreme weather conditions caused by severe climate change, forced us to rethink our cooking class offers. I've been teaching classes for 12 years, and I can't remember a July so hot. We found ourselves thinking, how can we survive another summer of intense cooking classes? How can we bring joy to people, teach them something, share a part of our lives with them, when all you want to do is lay in the shade and drink iced tea. We reevaluated what we considered the low season, a time when you really want to share a table and a hearty meal with new friends, and decided to reintroduce a three-day experience that we suspended years ago. This three-day masterclass is also the answer to one of the most common feedback for our cooking classes. If only we could have more time. If only we could come back tomorrow. Well, we'll listen to you. On the first day, we will meet for an Italian breakfast at a local cafe. We will get to know each other, chatting over a selection of pastries and enjoying a cappuccino, espresso, macchiato, you pick it. Shopping at the local market for fruit, vegetables and cheese, we'll plan our menus for the three days. Then we'll stop at my favorite butcher. After the market, we'll drive to our kitchen studio in the countryside. While we cook, drink wine and eat together, you'll be learning how to create an Italian cooking repertoire. On the second and third day, we'll be able to make recipes that require a longer preparation and that usually are not included in one-day experiences. We'll bake bread or focaccia, try traditional torte da credenza, these pantry cakes, gems and preserves, cook our beans from scratch, learn our way with leftovers and the practical aspects of Italian cooking. In the afternoon, after the classes, you will have free time to explore the surrounding area, following our food guide. These masterclasses are taught to highlight the seasonality of local produce, of recipes, of food traditions and cultural habits. In November, it will be all about fall, with pumpkin and panco santi, a local traditional sweet bread. December will be about Christmas, so we will bake all the traditional Christmas sweet treats from Siena and we will work on a Christmas Tuscan menu. January and February will be all about winter recipes, 
warming soups and dishes, stews, something that requires a long cooking, but also some carnival treats. And then finally, the March Masterclass will be focused on the first early spring vegetables and maybe we will introduce also something about Easter. We want to offer you a new way of traveling, a new way of experiencing Tuscany and its food and traditions in a location that probably you know well, my town, Colle Valdelsa, uh, a town I really love because it's where I grew up, where I have all my friends and relationships, and where I know all the producers, the shop owners, the restaurants and cafes. And I want to share this with you. So tell me, could a town like Colle Valdelsa be your next destination for your holidays in Tuscany? What would convince you to pick a smaller town as your place to stay? What kind of information, narrative or storytelling would you need? Is there something that scares you in picking a lesser known destination? Let's talk about this on Substack. Pass by to share your thoughts on tourism or your experiences. I'd love to hear from you. You'll also find additional resources, links and readings to expand the concept of sustainable tourism. Thank you for listening. Now join the conversation. This is the end of today's episode of our podcast, Cooking with an Italian Accent. If you love this episode, share it with your friends and on social media using the hashtag Cooking with an Italian Accent and tagging Jules Kitchen. This podcast is hosted on Substack, the new writing platform where our newsletter, Letter from Tuscany, is also hosted. If you like this episode, want to share a comment about it and join the conversation, you can find the link in this episode's show notes. We call it a newsletter, but Letters from Tuscany is our own independent publication. We test, photograph and write each recipe just for you. It is a way of sharing all the recipes we like, created to inspire you to bring a little taste of Italy to your kitchen, for you and your family. So I'll see you on Substack. Ciao!